morning and happy Sabbath. Today's a high Sabbath. It's uh, church is full. We have visitors. How are you doing, brother? Hell, good to see you. <laughs> and today we're gonna have a baptism with this young man, Marcus. You know, I uh, met Marcus uh, when I first got here, and he was just kind of a quiet, reserved young man. And uh, I could tell he loved the Lord. And today uh, we're gonna baptize him. He wanted to make a public commitment to everyone saying to everyone that he loved God. He wants to give his life fully to him. And um, I'm just going to ask him a question, and he's going to let you all know. Marcus, why do you want to get baptized? Because I want to be closer with him and let him... I want to be closer with him. Just be... all right, there you go. That's good enough. <laughs> he wants to be close to the Lord. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to baptize him. I'm going to... Say a prayer over him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this young man. Lord, he loves you. He wants to serve you, Lord. And today, Lord, as we, as he commits himself to you publicly, I ask, Lord, that you fill him with a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may he be one of the young men, Lord, who proclaims the gospel before Jesus comes. Lord, may you walk with him. May you shelter him from evil. Lord, give him wisdom and knowledge, Lord, beyond his years. May he have the wisdom of Daniel and Joseph, Lord. May he have that commitment of Daniel and Joseph to walk in his ways. Lord, I ask this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Marcus, today, I'm a, as a minister of the gospel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Another one, too. <laughs> Amen. So Marcus wants to be a member of our church. Is there a motion that we accept him as a member of our church? Is there a motion? Is there a second? All of those in favor, please give us a loud amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, as you see him walking out, please give him a hug and welcome our little brother to church as a family member. Thank you so much. Let's, I'm going to say a prayer for him once more. Is that all right with you all? Yes. Dearly Father, Lord, you say that there is rejoicing in heaven when a sinner repents. Lord, today Marcus comes to you. And again, Lord, he just asks that every step of his life that you may guide him. Lord, may he continue to press forward. May he continue to keep his eyes, his eyes on you as he goes through life. Lord, I ask this of you in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for your blessings. Lord, I want to thank you for this awesome Sabbath, Lord, where we have witnessed a young man, Lord, who has committed his life to you. And Lord, at this moment, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Kids are pretty awesome, aren't they? Yes. You know, it, um, I, it still feels like yesterday when... Anna told me she was pregnant with Levi. It feels just like yesterday when she told me she was pregnant with Noah. You know, but I remember when, when, you know, when Levi was in her womb where she was pregnant with him, you know, how, um, how excited we were. This is our first child. You know, I was, let's see, I'm 34, 30, I was in my 30s. <laughs> I was in my early 30s when she told me that. You know, we had been married for six years. An old child, every time we'd come and visit my mom and dad, my dad would open the door and look behind us and say, where are the kids? Every single time. And um, when, we finally, when she finally told me, you know, it was just a time of excitement. And you know, when she went through all the stages, the first was the first trimester, you were pretty miserable. And then it, after that, it gets, you know, she was glowing. She was real happy and stuff, real bubbly. And we had our, our baby shower that Anna threw. <laughs> <laughs> she threw her own baby shower, and you know, was, she, we went all out. You know, this is our first child. You know, we were just really excited and stuff. And uh, we had some church members say, "Wow, Pastor, your baby shower was nicer than our wedding." <laughs> you know, that was all her doing. You know, it was all this Western theme, and it was just a time of excitement. You know, and we had we had gotten a whole bunch of gifts and stuff, and we had the the nursery room. It wasn't ready. We had a room, <laughs> and we had this crib, and all of the gifts and stuff were in the crib. And then one day, you know, we, we, she, she hadn't gotten her bag packed or anything like that, and she, uh, she called me up. I was working there at the transportation department. I mean, it literally feels like this just happened yesterday. 
And she told me she was crying. I was like, what's going on? You know, she's like, oh, I have to be induced. And, you know, I was happy. I was like, all right, that means I don't have to wait any more weeks. I was like, I'll be able to hold my child tomorrow. Of course, unfortunately, that didn't happen that way. It was actually a long, drawn-out process. I mean, you know, I remember holding him in, in my arms and stuff and just seeing him. And he just cried once. I mean, he was just a really quiet baby when it came to that. And, you know, the, just when, you know, when Noah came around and stuff, it was just kind of a surprise one month early and stuff. And just, it was a good time. It was a good time. You know, and it's, it's awesome to witness, to be able to understand the miracle of life. You know, so today, you know, we're during this Christmas season. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. And this is where we find the birth of Jesus Christ. And this is just the most amazing story that we have ever heard. I'm going to read, begin reading in verse 1. I want to welcome our brothers and sisters in Paris and in Cooper today. And we're watching us live. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now I'm sure that we have seen movies about the birth of Jesus Christ and, you know, we have a little, um, oh, blasted. What is that little thing with the decorations of Jesus and Nativity, we have a little nativity um, set up there in the boys' room and stuff. And this is just a beautiful story to be thinking about. But when you think and you consider of how it happened and the conditions that it happened in, it takes my breath away. You know, here is Jesus Christ. You know, we have read up to this. We have um, been going over this. You know, what happened a few days before or weeks before the, the birth of Jesus, the announcements to, to Elizabeth and to Zechariah, the announcement to, to Mary and to Joseph. And here is Jesus Christ being born. You know, when you look at some of the scriptures, when you look at um, Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 16, verse 7 through 13, we find that Jesus appeared to, to several people. We find that in, that in that passage, Jesus appeared to... Um, where are my notes here? Sorry. Sorry, let's begin with Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is where the Trinity forms man. You know, God is speaking and He says, Let us make man in our own image. I'm going to be giving a lot of passages so you don't... I mean, you can follow if you want, but I'm going to be going kind of fast. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After Adam and Eve fell, after they sinned, after they disobeyed God, God told them that out of one of the descendants of Eve, the Messiah would come. Said so it would step on the, the head of the serpent, but the serpent would bruise his heel. This was the first promise that we have, and this is the first glimpse that we have of how the Messiah was to come to the world. That he would be born as a human being. He would be born as a child. After that, if we go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 16 through 19, it says that three angels visited Abraham. Three angels visited Abraham, and it says that Abraham understood it. He realized that this was the Lord. This was Jesus who had appeared to Abraham. When we go to the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 30, we find and we understand that Jacob wrestled with Jesus. His name was changed from Jacob to Israel. And if we look at the scriptures, we are, we are able to understand, we're able to comprehend that the only one who has power to change someone's name is a divine being, one of the Trinity. When we go to Genesis, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, we find where God, or Jesus, calls Moses. You all remember, and that's just a, such a powerful story, where Jesus calls Moses, and Moses is trying to find an excuse to get out of it. But Lord, what am I going to tell them when they, when they ask for who sent me? Tell them, I am who I am. When we go through John chapter 8 and 9, Jesus says to the people, before Abraham was, 
I am. The same exact wording that Jesus used in Exodus chapter 32 or Exodus chapter 3, Jesus uses in John as well. When we continue to go on and we go through Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, we find that Jesus was a pillar of light in the nighttime and a cloud that covered them in the, in the heat of the sun. I think it's Deuteronomy. I forgot to write that scripture down here. Where Moses is having this conversation with, with Jesus. <laughs> he says, I want to see you. I want to see you. And he says, you can't see my glory. But he put him in a cleft of a rock. He put him in somewhere safe. And it says he passed before Moses and Moses saw his back. When we go to the, the, the situation with Hagar in Genesis chapter 16, we find that it says that Hagar also saw his back. And he said, Jesus said to her, go back to your owner. Go back to Sarah. We find that Jesus also appeared to Joshua in, in uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 15. We find that he appeared to Gideon in Judges chapter 16, verse 11 through 24. We find in Revelation, then later. So here we have all the times where Jesus appeared to, the, to humanity. Whether a pillar of, of light or, or a cloud, or he appeared to them as an angel, he appeared to them as a man. Jesus had a connection with people. He had been in connection with them. He had spoken to them. They had seen him, even if it was just his back. Jesus had encountered humanity before he was born. But then when we go a little bit later in the, new, in the book of Revelation, we go to the New Testament. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. It says, this is a book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. If I'm mistaken, it's in Revelation chapter 4 or 5. It says that this was the Lamb who was able to open the book with seven seals. So all through the book of Revelation, we find where, Je where John is in vision and he sees Jesus. And where at once he had seen Jesus as a carpenter's son, where at once he had seen Jesus in poverty, as somebody who didn't have wealth, as somebody who didn't have all the latest trends and stuff, as a man who did, probably didn't even have a horse of his own or a donkey of his own everywhere they went, what did they do? They walked. Now he sees him in the book of Revelation. He sees him in vision in all glory and honor and splendor. And he sees the worship that he had before he came down to earth to be a human. When we go to, to the book of um, Colossians, we, it says for Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So Jesus Christ has always existed. We don't understand it. <laughs> we can try to understand it. But our minds don't understand infinity. Because we had a birth, and we have an end. But Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they have always existed. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He has always existed. So here in the book of Luke, when you go to the book of Luke chapter 2, this is the greatest miracle that has happened. The angel Gabriel told Mary, you are, you are beloved, you are trusted, you are the woman who will carry the Messiah. You are the woman that every woman wished they could have carried up until this point in time. But Joseph was given the awesome privilege. Joseph was given the tremendous privilege of being the father. <laughs> Are you beginning to understand where this is going? When the Trinity got together and said, let us make man in our own image, this is him in Luke chapter 2, the creator of heaven and earth. When we look at the book of Revelation and we find Jesus being worshipped, this is him in Luke chapter 2. When we find a messenger coming to Abraham and telling him everything is going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, this is him right here being born. When we find him in Exodus calling out to Moses from a burning bush and calling him and giving him a mission, telling him the plan that he has for the nation of Israel, he says, I am who I am, this is him. When we find, you know, the person writing on the Ten Commandments and God tell, or Jesus tells him, do not let anybody touch the mountain because they will die, this is him in Luke chapter 2. Jesus Christ, the, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who came to be born as a child, the one who was the lamb, but at the same time is a lion of the tribe of Judah. This is him in Luke chapter 2. Have you thought about that? 
you know, as I, as I was thinking about this and, you know, thinking about how spoiled our children were. <laughs> you know, they were born in beautiful hospitals. Nurses tending to them. You know, I was just watching over them amazed that this was our child. And to see how Jesus was born, it broke my heart. Let me read it to you. Verse 6 again, so it says, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Have you thought about that? So this is Jesus Christ, and this is what amazes me. This is the first thing that I want us to understand from this. The humility... <laughs> The humility of the creator of heaven and earth. When we go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 18 and he tells Jeremiah, go to the potter's house and see what he is doing. He is essentially telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I'm the potter. I don't mind getting my hands dirty. When you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 and 19, God is telling Isaiah, I don't mind getting my hands dirty. I will make them white like wool. It's a process. It's a, it's a time-consuming process where I have to get my fingers in there and have to make sure that everything that is dirty is out of them. That is God. That is God, that the whole creator, the whole entire universe is now here, wrapped in rags, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the galaxies and everything that we see, all the stars, this is him right here, wrapped in a manger, because there is no room for him in the ends. But that's what he chose. That's what he chose. You know, it's, it reminds me of a story. You know, we went to Mexico on a mission trip. And uh, there was this building that had been built without a foundation. So you can just imagine what happened. There was no foundation. They just started laying block upon block in, on the dirt. Afterwards, then they put concrete uh, inside. That roof was caving in. That was the Dorcas closet. <laughs> Nobody was getting anything out of that room. Because <laughs> everybody was afraid that the roof was just going to collapse on them. You know, so they had built this beautiful church there and stuff, and they asked us as a mission team to go and demolish that building and carry out all the block and everything and all the rubble. So we said, that's fine. We had a whole bunch of um, wheelbarrows and stuff. We had mallets to break everything or sledgehammers. And then, you know how, how young teenage guys are. Everybody's trying to measure up, you know, who's the strongest, who's the toughest. And, you know, you just kind of pick on each other a little bit just in good fun. So there was this older gentleman that, would, that was coming there and stuff, and, you know, we're just, you know, we're talking trash and stuff, and he's laughing with us and, you know, just having a grand old time. You know, that's just what you do. You kind of pick on each other and laugh, and you don't take things personal. And then the, our pastor comes up to him, he's like, yes, you guys, you need to calm it down. But I'm like, oh, what's going on? I'm like, that guy was a union president. I'm like, What? He's like, yeah, he's retired now, he, but he was a union president last year. I was like, no. I was like, no, no, no. He's like, yeah. So, you guys, so after that, I went and told everybody, I said, like, guys, stop. <laughs> we, can't, we can pick on anyone else, but don't pick on this guy. <laughs> and I came and I talked to him afterwards, like, hey, pastor, you know, I'm so sorry. We didn't know you were a pastor. We didn't know that you were the union president. He says, it doesn't matter. I didn't identify, I didn't introduce myself as a union president. I didn't introduce myself as a pastor. And I thought to myself, that is amazing. The humility of this man, although at a point in time he was an extremely important person in the church and still an extremely person in the church, he didn't introduce himself as that. As that. He chose to be with a bunch of mission trippers and, you know, it can be a little bit, it's a daunting task. He had raggedy clothes and he was out there picking up rubble with us putting everything to wheelbarrows and sweating alongside with us. And I thought to myself, that is amazing. That is what I want to emulate. So here is Jesus Christ, the creator of all the heavens and the earth, the one who has always existed and will always exist. Here he is, wrapped in humanity. And without a single advantage over any of us, without being born in the palaces, he could have been the son of David, like I said last week. His mother could have been Esther. He didn't have any of that. He didn't want any of that. He wanted to be born right smack dab in the middle of it. This is Jesus. Somebody who wanted to come and present himself to us and tell us who God really was. And, you know, and it just, 
It humbled me because so many times we go around as church members introducing ourselves of, oh, I'm the pastor, I'm an elder, or, oh, I don't want to get my hands dirty, oh, I, that's not, that's below me. <laughs> you all understand where I'm going? We can learn from Jesus. We can learn from his humility. We can learn from the fact that so many times we come to church and we want everything to be about me. We want everything to be about us. But here he is. He's going to save humanity. And he didn't demand a room in a five-star inn. He didn't demand that his mother have the latest robes or fashions. He didn't demand that all of a sudden his father would be made a rich man. He didn't demand any of that. It's a lesson for us. You know, there's this song. I'm sure most of us have heard it. I'm just going to read a few of the lines on this song. As I was preparing my sermon, actually, this is a sermon, this is a song that gave me the idea to talk about this. Did you know? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Those are powerful words. That here is Mary, this humble teenager. Here is Joseph, this humble carpenter. And they have been given the awesome privilege. <laughs> they have been given the awesome privilege to carry in their arms the great I am. The most beautiful story. Here is our king, the whole king of the whole entire universe. The one who would be our Messiah. The one who would be the one who would exchange his life for us. For hours so that we could have eternal life and he's born as a baby in a tiny little town <laughs> some poor people now they were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night and behold an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid this is verse 10 then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, we put these nativity scenes and we put these nativity, you know, little statues and stuff around our houses. We see them around outside of our churches and stuff, and it's beautiful. But the reason it's so beautiful is because Jesus Christ chose to be born as a human. He didn't have any physical advantage over us. Can you imagine as a baby? Do you understand how indefenseless, indif undefenseless, how helpless children are? <laughs> that works. Do you understand how helpless children are, and yet he trusted that Mary and Joseph were the perfect ones to raise him. That was plan A. That was the only plan, and it was a perfect plan, and it worked. And brothers and sisters, as we go through this Christmas season, let's remember this. Let's remember how awesome and how amazing this story is of how the Savior of the world, how the Savior, our Savior, our Lord, our King, was born as a child. How our Savior, our Lord, our King was born to Mary, just a teenage mother. To Joseph, just a poor carpenter. How he didn't demand uh, a baby shower. I was like, what is that thing called? He didn't demand a baby shower. There was no, you know, um, those parties of, guess what we're going to have? There was no, no great announcements where they were mailed out of, hey, we're pregnant. There was none of that. Jesus didn't need all of that to be born. He came to save us, and this is the method that he chose. I don't really know what else to say about this. It just it, it, it leaves me in awe that this is what the method that Jesus Christ chose to be born under. It leaves me in awe that God is so humble 
And this is what I want us to get out of this. That Jesus Christ was so humble that he didn't mind getting his whole entire life dirty for us. That he was so humble, that he was so perfect, that he came and was born without any advantage over us to be able to save us. Brothers and sisters, we can learn from this. We can learn to be humble. We can learn to be selfless like Jesus was. So as we go out this Christmas season, you know, yeah, Jesus Christ was not born December 25th. Hate to break it to you all. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what day he was born in. Does it really matter what day he was born in? No. What matters is that he was born as a baby. What matters is that he lived amongst us. What matters is that he died and resurrected and is coming soon. Brothers and sisters, let us be ready. May we be the ones who sent out the, sent out the announcement that our King is coming. May we be the ones who proclaim the gospel that our King, that our Savior is returning soon and that anyone who wants to be with him can and will be with him. May we proclaim it like the angel did. May we be ready to greet him like the shepherds did. Brothers and sisters, we have a huge task before us. But Mary and Joseph did too. <laughs> but if we put our life in God's hands, if we trust in Him, if we ask the Lord to help us, to guide us, He will help us to carry out the fulfillment of the gospel, the, pro the proclamation of the gospel. That is what is entrusted to us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we consider this beautiful story, Lord, this beautiful story of how Jesus Christ was born to Mary and Joseph. Lord, what an awesome privilege it must have been for Joseph, Lord, to be able to raise the creator of heaven and earth. What an awesome privilege it must have been, Lord, for Mary to be able to kiss your face. Lord, as we go out of this church today, may we tell others, Lord, of the humble king that we serve, of the servant king that we serve. May we proclaim it loud and clear that he is coming again. May we proclaim it loud and clear that anyone who wishes to be saved can be saved through the power of Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen.